surpasses all understanding, which has its source within the very nature of Thank you. You've got a great organist here. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Barry Kubler. I've been here before. For those of you who have not been here when I have been here, I'm from down the road a little piece, uh, St. Peter's Plant City. I'm retired. I just live in that area. But it's a delight always to come back at Jim's invitation, so I thank him for that. And it's good to see you all this morning. Glad to be here with you. Most of what you need is right here in this bulletin. So let us begin. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you, and grant that they may know and understand what things they ought to do, and also may have grace and power faithfully to accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the book of Deuteronomy. Moses said to the people of Israel, the Lord your God will make you abundantly prosperous in all your undertakings, in the fruit of your body, in the fruit of your livestock, and in the fruit of your soil. For the Lord will again take delight in prospering you, just as he delighted in prospering your ancestors when you obey the law, Lord, your God, by observing his commandments and decrees that are written in this book of the law, because you turn your to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Surely this commandment that I am commanding you today is not too hard for you, nor is it too far away. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will go up to heaven for us and get it for us so that we may hear it and observe it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will cross to the other side of the sea for us and get it for us so that we may hear it and observe it. No, the Lord, the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart for you to observe. The word of the Lord. Be to God. Psalm for this morning is Psalm 25, verses 1 through 9, in the bulletin insert, uh, in the bulletin, and uh, on page 614 of the Book of Common Prayer. And we'll, I'll read to the half verse, and the congregation will finish the verse. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. My God, I put my trust in you. Let none who look to you be put to shame. Show me your ways, O Lord. Lead me in your truth and teach me. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and love. Remember not the sins of my youth and my transgressions. Gracious and upright is the Lord. He guides the humble in doing right. He teaches the way of the Lord. All the paths of the Lord are love and faithfulness. A reading from Colossians. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ in Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. In our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. You have heard of this hope before in the word of gospel that has come to you, just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, so it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly com comprehended the grace of God. This you learn from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying, praying for you and 
asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power, and may you be prepared to endure everything with patience, while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The word of the Lord. the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Christ. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said, you have given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. But wanting to test himself, he asked, Jesus, what and who is my neighbor? Jesus answered, a man was going from down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by, the, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, and he came into that place, he saw him, and pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling near, near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him, bandaged the wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him in his own animal, brought him to the inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took two denarii, gave him to the innkeeper and said, take care of him, and when he, I come back, I will pay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? He said, the man who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. The Gospel of the Lord.
the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Is there anything in this story that we heard this morning about the Good Samaritan that you've not heard before? Anybody? Everybody knows the story, don't they? You've heard it at least once or twice or maybe a hundred times. I believe it's safe to say the Good Samaritan is a story we've heard more than once or twice and we're pretty familiar with. At least that's what we might think, right? Isn't that always the truth about something we've heard so many times? We think we know the story. We've got all the pertinent points. We, in, you know, brought them inside of us. So we were pretty, we're pretty confident that this story is something we've got a good handle on. Well, my brothers and sisters, this morning I'd like you to set aside any familiar understandings or preconceived ideas that you might already hold about this story. No matter what the story is, the Good Samaritan or another story. If we hear it often enough, we tend to sometimes find ourselves in a rut with respect to how we understand it. Context is important. My home church, if you will, is St. Peter's in Plant City. And uh, the many times that I've had occasion to preach there and to lead Bible studies, etc., etc., the folks at St. Peter's will be quick to tell you so one of my favorite words is context. Context is so important in life, not just biblically or a sermon or whatever, a story we might have heard before, but in all of life, context is important. Every one of you here has a context in their life that is different from the person sitting next to you. Context is important. And the story of the Good Samaritan deserves our understanding of its context in order to truly understand what Jesus is saying to us today. As we know, the story begins this way. A certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who both stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Some years ago, I was blessed to have spent a month in the Holy Land I traveled the length and the breadth of Israel, what many people call the fifth gospel, the geography, the place in which Jesus was raised, all the important biblical stories that we know in the gospels about Jesus and his ministry, right there in the Holy Land, the fifth gospel. There is a, there is a holiness about the place itself, especially when you walk in Jesus' shoes or you've been to the places that are described in those many stories. In the first century, during Jesus' time, the old road from Jerusalem to Jericho was little more than a winding up and down treacherous path. When the Romans took over, they had completed some work on it, widening it enough to accommodate some chariot traffic. Even today, you need to pay attention to what you're doing if you're going to drive that same route. It goes around one hairpin turn after another descending over about a 17-mile trip, about 1,300 and some feet. In Jesus' day, that route was known as the Bloody Way because of all the stories told of thieves and robbers lurking behind rocks and bushes. Muggings along the road were numerous, very common. And the story continues. By chance... A certain priest was going down that way. When he saw the man who had been beaten lying on the side of the road, he passed by on the other side. Now at first thought, it would be tempting for us to be critical and come down really hard on the priest. After all, you'd think of all the people in the world, a priest would be the first one you'd think who would stop and render aid to a beaten man. But remember, Context is important. This was the first century. The priest's job in the first century was principally a sacramental one. His primary duties were performed in the temple. Priests were not expected to perform manual labor or to be involved in what were considered the unclean tasks 
of nursing the sick and the wounded. And if the man was indeed dead, and the priest so much as touched him, he would have been considered unclean. And the law required that the priest would then have to isolate himself for seven days. Something about what's going on in the world today reminds me of that. Which also reminds me of another story in which a man is said to have been as good a man as he knows how to be. Anybody ever heard that before? He was as good a man as he knows how to be. So given the times and the circumstances, the religious understanding of a priest's duties and responsibilities, we might want to just cut him a little bit of slack. He was just doing his job on his way from the temple in Jerusalem, perhaps to the synagogue in Jericho, back home to see his family. We don't know for sure. In any case, his responsibility was to be a priest, to reserve his time and his efforts to priestly duties, which required that he keeps himself ritualistically clean. He was as good a man as he knew how to be. With his training and the responsibilities of his office, he wouldn't have given a second thought to avoiding a victim lying by the side of the road. If anything, he would have made a conscious effort maybe to just cross over, keep his distance. And the story continues. In the same way, a Levite, when he came to the place, saw the man lying on the side of the road, passed by on the other side. Well, here, my brothers and sisters, uh, I think we have a, a place where we need to sort of level the playing field a little bit. Levites were also officials of the temple, those subordinate to the priests. When the 12 tribes of Israel were first established, the tribe of Levi was set apart to tend to the priestly functions. Over time, as they do, things changed. Responsibilities were shared. But the Levites were able to maintain their close connection with the inner workings of the temple. In Jesus' day, one of the things Levites were responsible for was the temple treasury. They got to count the money, make the budget, make sure things were paid for. So here was a Levite, perhaps one of the treasurers of the temple. We don't know that for a fact, but perhaps. Possibly carrying a large sum of money on his way from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he hears the groans of a man in anguish by the side of the road. What would you have done? What would you have done? A common ploy of thieves in those days was to have someone pretend to be hurt, thereby luring an unsuspecting traveler to their side where others would be waiting and hiding. The thieves would accost them, beat them, rob them, and if the traveler was lucky, leave them alive. Well, my friends, the use of such ploys is still something that occurs today. Situational awareness is just as true and important today as it was in Jesus' time. You have to be careful. I remember my mother and father and grandparents would tell me that on occasion. Be careful. Mind yourself. So if you're willing to give the priest a break for failing to stop and render aid to the man's lying on the side of the road, we might want to go a little bit easy on the Levite as well, don't you think? All things being equal, we're likely to have done the same thing. Then Jesus goes on to say, but a certain Samaritan as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. He went to the man's side. He bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. The Samaritan then set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, took care of him. And on the next day, when the man left, he took out two denarii, gave them to the host, presumably the innkeeper, and said to him, take care of him. Whatever you spend beyond what I've given you, I will repay when I return. Now, 
If you were an observant Jew in the first century, well versed in your history and understanding of the Jewish culture, and you'd been listening to Jesus tell the lawyer this story, you'd probably go ballistic at this time. For Jesus to use a Samaritan as the good guy in his story would most likely be seen as very, very offensive. It would not be a stretch to say that the Jews hated the Samaritans more than they hated the Romans. And why, you would ask? While the Jews and the Samaritans shared a common ancestry, that's about as far as it went. The Jews considered the Samaritans to be racially inferior. They called them half-breeds because they had intermarried with the Assyrians during what was known as the Babylonian exile. They were also considered anything but righteous. The Jews believed that the Samaritans worshipped multiple gods, which they did, as opposed to the one true God, Yahweh, the God of the Jews. To make matters even worse, a group of Samaritans had recently defiled the Jewish temple. This was during the Passover festival event, and they were scattering human bones in one of the courts of the temple precincts. Now you put all of that together and you can understand why the Jewish Mishnah, a commentary if you will, taught that, and I quote, he that eats the bread of a Samaritan is like the one that eats the flesh of swine, end quote. We know what the Jews thought about pigs, right? They don't eat pigs. They don't even touch them. They don't even come near them. So you can just imagine the reaction when Jesus told this story. To make the hero a Samaritan was a slap in the face to any upstanding Jew. That is why when Jesus goes on to ask the lawyer, now which of these three do you think seemed to be a neighbor to him who fell among the robbers? Question mark. The lawyer couldn't even bring himself to saying the word Samaritan. Instead he mumbles under his breath, well the one who showed mercy to I guess. My brothers and sisters, the parable of the Good Samaritan exposes the prejudice of the Jewish people in Jesus' day. It undermines their tendency to judge who's worthy of God's love and who is not. Contrary to the belief of Jesus' day, it was not the priests or the Levites or even the Jews who held the inside track on the kingdom of God. Rather, it was whoever God chose to call. It's God's choice, not theirs. Including, I might add, some lowly Samaritans, if God so chooses. To this day, this parable screams, literally screams at us. Gotcha. Gotcha. As we are confronted face to face with our own self-righteousness. But for the writer of Luke's gospel, even that was not enough. He presents the parable in the context of an encounter between Jesus and a lawyer. He takes it one step further. Well, let's sort of replay the tape a little bit. A lawyer who is intent on trapping Jesus provides him, he thinks, with a test. He asks Jesus what he had to do to inherit eternal life. Jesus responds by directing the question back to the lawyer, saying, what's it say in the law? How do you read it? And the lawyer answers the question by quoting the great commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Now, we might rightly assume Jesus doesn't have any quarrel with that response. Would you all agree? I would. He says, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Whew. Good answer, said the lawyer. But the lawyer, he doesn't stop there. Trying to, as the scriptures tell us, to justify himself. He then asks Jesus, follow-up question, who is my neighbor? 
That question then provides Jesus with the opening that he needs to tell the story of the Good Samaritan, beginning by saying a certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, etc., etc. In that context, my friends, the parable catches us in a trap of our own making. Love the Lord your God with all you've got. Yeah, I agree with that. Love your neighbor as yourself, and you'll have eternal life. I'm right there with you, Jesus. I'm all for it. Count me in. But first tell me who is my neighbor. Uh-oh. Define the parameters. Tell me who's in. Tell me who's out. Specify the limits for me, will you please? Be concrete. Black and white. Then I will know precisely what I have to do to measure up, to be righteous, to justify myself. I'm digging that hole deeper. Like that lawyer, we find ourselves wanting to define neighbor in reference to others. Jesus says no to that. He says the only way to define your neighbor is in reference to yourself. Yourself. He places the burden of proof on us. For Jesus, our neighbor is not the object of the sentence. The subject, the subject. The question isn't who is my neighbor, but rather what kind of neighbor are we? Or to put it differently, the neighbor Jesus was talking about was not the man on the side of the road at all, but the voice, the conscience that we have speaking to us within our hearts as listeners in both the first century and in the 21st century. Wow, that's a wake up call. Now the judgment's on us. How did that happen so quickly? What kind of neighbors are we? And if that sounds familiar to you, it should. My brothers and sisters, the bottom line to understanding the good news embedded in the story of the Good Samaritan is pretty straightforward. It's a baptismal one. When we set aside our assumptions and natural tendencies to want to make Jesus' story work for us, we come face to face with the responsibilities that we committed ourselves to when we were baptized. Remember your baptismal covenant? Somewhere around page 302 in the Book of Common Prayer. So listen once more to the beginning of Jesus' story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Dade City and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Now I ask yourself, yourself and myself, how are we going to respond the next time that we cross paths with someone in need? What kind of a neighbor will we prove to be? Amen. Let us affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty.
all our heart and with all our minds, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all peoples, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our Bishop Dabney, for all the clergy and people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our president, our governor, and for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Dade City and every city and community, and for those who live in them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the good earth which God has given us, and for the wisdom and will to conserve it, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the aged and the infirm, for the widowed and orphans, for the sick and the suffering, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We pray for all of those with urgent and ongoing need in our parish prayer list, and especially. We pray for Dara Morgan, Bill McGovern, Eddie Hancock, Larry Schwartz, Peggy Fetch, Paula Bark, Bob Worth, Betty Carey, Tammy Bentley, John Sutherland, Jesse McGee, Larry Teston, Sarah Lynn Good, George Bell, the Reverend Richard Brent, Cecil and Edie McGavin, Wayman Stockton, Judy Henry, Wayne and Sheila Highsmith, Joyce DeLozier, Laura Melton. For those who are in need of ongoing prayer, we pray for B.J. McCabe, Kenneth H., for Janet, Leon and Betty Milton, Cecil Hicks, Casey, Sue Shurzba, excuse me for the pronunciation, for Fred Wells, Karen Berger, for Aiden, Anna Kirkland, Jennifer Greenbaum, Barbara Jones, Jock Whiteman, Chad Carey, Deacon Ben Creelman, George Avatikian, Lucy, Tom Parks, B.B. Kane, Dominique, Chick and Nancy Meach, Sandra Sartain, Kathy N., Ann Becker, Perry and Linda Kane, Nicholas, Melanie McGavern, Jack Finnerty, Eddie Soult, John Harrison, Susan and Olivia, Edward Kovula, B.J. Croft, Molly McKenzie, Joe Heffen, Jean Kredinsky, Chris Correa, Noah, Jerry and Diane Rice, Jenna Coultry, Garrett, Terry and Denise McKenzie, Robert Alfonso, Dave and Marcy, Jim and Janice Tab, Brent Price, Jim Bailey, Dave and Marge Moffat, Debbie Quinn, Carol Heal, Al and Diane Healer, Barbara Toole, Paul W., Eric and Jeannie Dwight, Myrna Belden, Rose Newman, Norma, for Regina Ballou, Yvonne Agner, Jim Stokely, Gail Mellon, Frida Barlow, Jean Samuels, Jennifer Germain, Belle Thompson, Mark Pike, Melinda Bessinger, George Griffenberg, Steve C., Baby Lathan, Dennis Alfonso, Logan Hacker, and for those we might name now, either silently or aloud. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captives, and all who remember and care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. 
For all who have died in the hope of the resurrection and for all the departed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the deliverance from all danger, violence, and oppression, and degradation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That we may end our lives in faith and hope without suffering and without reproach, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Defend us, deliver us, and in thy compassion protect us, O Lord, by thy grace. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. In the communion of the ever-blessed Virgin Mary and all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our Lord. To thee, O Lord, our God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please stand. And my brothers and sisters, the peace of the Lord be always with you. Please be seated. Is there a designated a announcement person, or does that sure fall to me? I think I know the answer to that question. All right, well, here's my, here's my answer to that question. Do you all know how to read? Is there anything in the bulletin today that you do not understand? Is there anything not in the bulletin today that we might need to refresh people's memories about? Anyone? Perfect. You passed that test. <laughs> However, we do need to acknowledge some special things like birthdays and anniversaries. Are there any who have a birthday or an anniversary we need to celebrate today? We did at the early service. We have one back here? Oh, yeah, you need to come all the way up here with me. <laughs> We're going to make an example out of you. <laughs> Anyone else? You're just not saying. Okay. Well, how are you? How old? I know, I said, how are you? <laughs> I'm fine. But since you asked, how old are you? I'm going to be 71. You'll be 71. God bless you. That's terrific. Yeah. <laughs> 70, is, 70 is a popular decade because we had three people this morning that were all in their 70s. I'm going to be 75 in about two months. Yeah, see, we're in the same decade. Mm -hmm. That makes us brother and sister. <laughs> All right, I'm sure there are others as well, so let us pray. Most gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for this gift, the gift of birth, the gift of all the opportunities, hopes, and dreams that you bring with us into this life. I thank you for that gift, and I ask that you continue to provide that gift, that understanding, and that that wonderful guidance that you have offered here in these 71 years. Continue to be with her. And Lord, we ask this through the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit he leaves with us. And in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Happy birthday. Thank you. All right. All right, anything else? Good. Walk in love. As Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
use the reserve. Eucharistic prayer B. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For by water and the Holy Spirit, you have made us a new people in Jesus Christ, our Lord, to show forth your glory in all the world. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil, and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, 
our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son and his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection unto your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country, where with the blessed Saint Mary and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters, through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Amen. Body of Christ. The blood of Christ. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Amen.
let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you now and forever. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. 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 <laughs>